Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzingo's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by Market5. I'm your co-host, Joel Alcon, along with Garrett Cook, and we have Kenny Polcari on the line. He's the director of New York Stock Exchange Floor Operations for O'Neill Securities. Kenny, how you doing on this Friday morning? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? We're doing great. We're excited about the derby, the fight and everything, and my niece's graduation. We got a lot of good stuff going on, but... Uh, there was a rest earlier in the week, and I uh, just wanted to get your take on it. They finally solved the reason for the uh, flash crash. Are you sleeping better at night? I think, I, listen, I, I hear you. I think the whole issue that you can't turn around and just blame this whole flash crash just on this one uh, this one individual. Now, clearly, he played a role in it, I would imagine. It's the spoofing and it's the, you know, the, 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 the spoofing and the way that the, the diversity guys kind of use the system. I can't believe he's the only one out there doing it. I'm sure there's probably uh, uh, some more chips to fall, I would imagine, because it would be difficult to say there's one guy sitting in his mother's basement in his pajamas in London that brings down the whole U.S. market. That doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. I understand how it happened. I understand why it happened. I understand, though, that that... that, that that strategy is a strategy employed by, you know, a range of people in that particular part of the industry, right, frequency traders. And that's been, I think, one of the issues that a lot of people have been screaming about, you know, in, in terms of market structure down in Washington over how, you know, we've lost control of some of this technology, in, in fact, where, uh, you know, the technology becomes so advanced and that they, regulators can't keep up with the pace at which technology is advancing. And so, and you get this issue. Now, that being said, I think then the problem that, you know, the the very large order that was entered by that asset manager in the Midwest certainly didn't help the situation. But I, I can't, I can't believe it. I don't think you can point your finger at this one guy. I do, though, think that he played a role in it. Certainly, he had a history of it. You go back if you read the story. They've been, they've been tracking this guy, which is a whole another conversation we can have. They've been tracking this guy for two or three years to begin with, concerned about his his style, concerned about the way that he was manipulating or or or, or, or allegedly manipulating his quotes in, in the markets, and they were trying to make it very clear to him, but yet no one ever did anything about it. So so it's I think it's confusing to the to the public when they read this story and they see five years later that all this stuff comes out and they everyone's scratching their head going, you know, where the hell were these guys when it was happening? Why didn't they put a stop to it before it happened? Even on the very day they had sent him an email about you know orders being um uh, you know, bids and offers being real and not 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 being uh, not being never intended to be traded against, and so I think that's a, I think that just opens up the conversation to a much wider conversation about current market structure, the way technology is used, and and the inability for regulators to keep up, whether they're U.S. regulators or global regulators. Because I don't think this is just a U.S. story. I think you know the, the markets are so automated around the world that this is a global story, and so global regulators. I think I think it's a conversation about the state of the global regulator. And uh, it took so long for this to, you know, to come out, too. I mean, I think you're echoing the sentiments that uh, we had Joe Saluzian, uh That was it earlier in the week or mm -hmm. last, last week? Friday. We had him last week. Uh, right. You know, Dennis, uh, my uh, usual partner on the show. I mean, it's 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 scary if one guy actually had this much influence. Well, it is, but I got to tell you, what's even more frustrating about what you just said is it took them, you know, two years or three years or five years to find it. In fact, it took some. The regulators themselves didn't even find it. I think that's even the frustrating part. You had some some citizen on his own start to undertake the, the his own analysis and his own uh, understanding about what happened to bring it to the regulators themselves two years after the event and said, "Hey, look, look at this data." Look at this particular trader. Look at these orders. Look at the cancellations. Look at the speed at which he enters and cancels and enters and cancels. And 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 what he tries to create in the marketplace, meaning you know either supply or demand, depending on which way he was trying to manipulate the market. It wasn't until that one individual, still unnamed, right, who brought that information to the regulators, and then and then they looked at it. I mean, by by their own admission, they said they weren't they weren't looking at spoofing type of strategies when they when they were trying to when they were trying to decipher for what happened during the flash crash and then they turn around and they and they and they blame complete they, they put the complete blame on the asset manager who by the way is a legitimate money manager versus uh, you know the, the the high frequency trading industry which is you know certainly it's a valid industry I get it but I think it points right to the fact that you know that the that, that technology advances so quick and that these guys use the technology and listen it's out there I get it but they use it, and the regulars can't keep up with it. And I think that's why now you're starting to see a lot of people back away from it. You're seeing them back away from dark pools in terms of some of the big investment banks because there's all this 
technology that, you know, is all of a sudden kind of right on the line. Is it, is it black or white or is it kind of gray and nobody wants to get involved in it anymore? And so, you know, just this week, Wells Fargo, you saw pulled out of the low touch business, right? Pulled out of that, the, the automated high frequency dark pool business, right? Um, I think that's on top of two or three of them that we've seen pull out. I think there'll probably be more. And I think that's actually right, right? I, I think because at some point, investors in this country and people in this country don't want U.S. markets to be viewed as a casino. And I think part of the problem is right now, that's how a lot of people view it, because they don't understand how this happens. They don't understand how the market could be up 500 points and down 250 points and up 300 points and down 100 points all in one day. They don't get it. They don't understand it. To them, it's nerve-wracking. And these are people that are saving money every day, putting it in their 401k, trying to, trying to invest for the long term for retirement, and they don't understand it. And what we've done is we've created a market now that's fractured and fragmented, not, no more centralized, and it feels like uh, to many people that it's a casino. And I think events like this only highlight that. And so I think, in the end, I think it's actually a good conversation to have because I think it's going to bring a lot of that to light and at least uh, stimulate the conversation. Well, Kenny, we could talk all day about this. I, I love the HFT yes, we stuff. Could. I could, yes, we I could go back and forth with you. But in the interest of our, our viewers, why don't we move on? Let me get some let me get some views from you on LinkedIn here because we, we've the, the stock just got hammered yesterday. I think it was down over right. hundred dollars throughout the day and got just hammered last night. You got any views? What what are you looking at on this? Stock? No, well, listen. I think it goes listen, it goes right to it goes right to like the Twitter story, right? It's a high growth name. It's almost impossible to offer the Ford Ford guidance on these stocks. I mean, these, these Twitter names like Twitter and LinkedIn and these other high growth names are not stocks like IBM or Coca-Cola or General Electric that are big blue chip Americana names that have a product that have a history that have revenues that you know have a have a consistency these stocks are listen they're valid stocks they're valid companies but they but it's difficult to forecast and then I think what happens is when they make a forecast and then they miss it the market punishes them tremendously I mean look what's happened to Twitter and now look what's happened to LinkedIn down 20 percent trading just around 200 bucks right now which is down 20 percent from last night's close where it was already weaker and I think it just highlights the fact that if you're going to invest in these stocks you, you Clearly, most of the people investing go in with that mindset. They understand what the risk is. No one should really be surprised that when, when a company like this announces that they missed, that they're going to get punished. They're going to get punished big. And that's two in one week that we've seen that happen to. And I don't think, all I think it says is that clearly there's risk in the market and there's risk in those stocks. But if you're in those names, then you, then you should be prepared for it. If you're not, shame on you. You shouldn't be in them. Okay, let's uh, let's move on. Uh, last week, when the Nasdaq uh, finally made it back to 15-year climb to all-time high, uh, you were a little bit skeptical. I mean, it did break out, got all the momentum traders in, and then we had the flush out this week. Uh, by the dippers came in yesterday session, late in the day here. Uh, this has been pretty much the pattern of the corrections. You think this one has any more legs to it? Uh, you know, I, I think this one, I, I think the market stuck, right? And I said it a week ago, I said it in that note, right? And you pointed out to it, you know, that, that when the NASDAQ broke out, did it feel a little bit bubbly? Did it feel like it was ahead of itself? And in fact, I think, yes, it did. But I also think, yes, it was the end of the month, right? So you had some month end window, <laughs> window dressing or undressing, as you might say, depending on your point of view. Um, and so I think I think what you had was just that asset reallocations into the month. I think today, look, futures are already up seven points this morning. Certainly they're down twenty, so a little bounce back is not necessarily out of out of line. But I do think as we move forward, we go into the summer, we go into the, the third quarter, that the that the economy is going to continue to make steady but slow improvement, right? And I think slow is the key word here. It's not this robust, very very uh, aggressive recovery that you know we've seen in recoveries past. And this one, I think, is may be the new normal, and people have to get used to, um, uh, you know, what in fact may be a much longer, slower recovery. People are not necessarily going to be, you know, as happy or as excited about this recovery as they have about past ones, but I do think that the market's okay here. I do think that the market's going to kind of continue to churn. I don't think it's going to run right away. I think by the end of the year, you know, we return 8 or 10%, which will be a return to normalcy, quite honestly, just like it was last year, and I think that actually makes people feel... Uh, you know, a little bit more secure. You know, you don't have these moves where the market's up 35%, and then we're scratching the head going, geez, it's up 35%. What's it going to do next year? And then when it's only up 10%, they're all disappointed. So I think a return to normalcy is good, and I think that's what you're going to get as we move into the rest of the year. You're going to, you'll see growth pick up, but you're not going to see it go gangbusters. It can't. I mean, look around. All you have to do is get up in the morning, go out and see your neighbor. Go out, go out to the center of your town. Look at the stores that are still empty. Look at the people that are still concerned about their drugs. Look at the people that are still concerned about losing their houses. So, so the whole conversation with the government said, oh, everything's great. Guess what? What world are you living in? 
And so I think that's kind of that's kind of the issue why the market's not going to take off. But nor is there any reason at the moment for the market to crash. Where are you going to go? Yields are zero, negative in some parts of the world. And so where are you going to go if you got money to invest and you got to put it somewhere? You search for yield. You, you got to be somewhere. So until there's a, a a real change, a real clarification from the Fed in terms of policy, monetary policy, and rates. I think this is the place to be, right? Once they start, then, you know, that might be a different story. And they're not starting in June. They're not starting in September or August. They, we might be lucky if they start in November. And I say lucky because at some point they have to start raising rates. They can't do this much longer. It's clearly not working, right? It's that we've spent $4.5 trillion, and look where we are. We're still struggling with zero growth rate. And so at some point something's got to change. So oh. Kenny, let me. So you're talking about you're talking about the new normals, and we're 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 discussing some of these. Uh, you know, the Fed having to raise rates. So clearly, it seems like you're coming. Well, I shouldn't say clearly, but it seems like you're coming from a position where the low rates have maybe driven valuations a little higher. So I want to ask you, do you think with this new normal that we should be expecting when companies buy other companies that they're going to be paying heavy premiums? I say this in light of the rumors of potential suitors for Salesforce. And the well, listen, the I, I, I think there's an opportunity out there. I think the fact that a lot of these companies now have got a lot of cash on the balance sheet, right? They've been managing their expenses over this over this crisis the last six or seven years. They've built up uh, large, 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 large wads of cash, and now they need to put it to work. And so that in and of itself may cause some overreaction into bidding war into some companies, if in fact will cause people to, to overpay. But... I think I think for the most part it won't. I think I think businesses, especially after what we've been through, are very very sensitive to valuations and what it's really worth and whether or not it's organically going to really help them, you know, really help them grow and where they're going to find their benefits. I don't think they're going to start overpaying. Although you may get the occasional you know bidding war, and that makes sense. Listen, you see that you see that across a range of asset classes mm-hmm. at, at some point, right? But for most for the most part, I don't see that happening. Yeah, I'm not really sure what to think about it myself either, but just, you know, talking to floor traders, talking to guys like you, uh, other guys we yeah, talk to, everybody seems worried about uh, this. Like I said, I think occasionally you get it, but I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a phenomenon that's going to hit every that's going to hit every deal, you know what I mean? Exactly. Kenny, I'm going to jump in here because we only have about a minute or two left with you. I want to get your take on the biotech sector. I mean, some people think we're in a bubble. Some people think we're still, or the bubbles burst. Some people think Look, we're, you know, debating if there even was a bubble. What's your take on that sector? No, well, uh, listen, I think there's a little bit of a bubble, but but look, that th- that sector has done very well this year, right? And you see it's also the sector that's now got hurt the most. I think it's down 9 or 10% just uh, in the last week and a half, once again, because it has outperformed. It was up 22 or 25%. So when people start to get anxious or people start to get nervous about whether it's Fed policy, whether it's a Greek tragedy, whether it's uh, an Iranian you know, geopolitical crisis, whatever it is, and people want to raise some cash just because they want to have the cash on, and in the event that the market cracks, they want to have the, the ammunition available to be able to put back to work. So where are they going to go? They're not going to go to the stocks that have underperformed. They're going to go and take money out of the stocks that have performed fairly well. And stocks that, by the way, will also get hit really hard if, in fact, you know, we all of a sudden get a downturn in the market or you get a geopolitical situation which causes real anxiety. Those stocks that have, been, that have outperformed will be the ones, and clearly they're all high-growth names. They're all, you know, we know them. The biotechs are very volatile, and so those will be the first ones uh, to get slammed. When, when when the market gets really anxious. So seeing actually the action of late money come out of those names and either be put aside as, as people are waiting maybe for a little bit more of a correction or just or just taken out of there and put to work in in in, uh, in more you know stable maybe Americana blue chip names for safety um, makes perfect sense to me. So no, I actually see probably a little bit more downside to the biotechs in terms of pressure on them. Um, but you know, listen, today the market's up. The market's going to be up six or seven points. So today the, the mood once again has changed. Everyone's going to be happy. Yes, it was down twenty today. It's up six. I was going, oh wow, look, it's all over. That correction's all over. Uh, I don't think so. Look, we broke the fifty day. I think the fifty day is now going to act as resistance at least at least for today. I don't think we're busting up and through it. I don't think there's anything so positive that's coming out today. Okay, ISM's going to come out. They're going to all of a sudden say, oh, look, ISM's great. Oh, everything's great. Rates are going up. Guess what? Look at all the other data. This is such a disconnect between the data and the economy. It's so frustrating for people. And so they don't get it, right? They don't get it. I don't think today's data is going to do anything at all to to solidify that argument. I think the market's going to hit resistance here, and then it's going to bounce around between its 50 and its 200 day for, for a little bit until it gets a little bit more clarity. Hey, Kenny, you got a derby pick for us? 
Yeah. You know something? So. I don't. And I thought about that when I when the phone rang this morning. I haven't. You know, I haven't even looked at the derby. I don't even know who's running in the derby uh, because uh, it, I've been it, caught up doing so many other things. I'm, I was going to do that today. Uh, Dortmund. If you, you tell get, me who's yeah, your pick. If you could get Dortmund at four or five to one, it might be worth a little bit of money. Okay. Right. Perfect. Kenny uh, Polcari. I appreciate that. Kenny Polcari, director of New York Store Flock Floor Operations for O'Neill Securities, joining us for a lively interview. Thanks a lot, Kenny. We really appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to take a look at this uh, steak florentine, okay? <laughs> Perfect. All right. Bye-bye. All right.